appropriate for today because this was um, a Hopkins physician, James Jude, who was living in Florida where he died, but was one of the CPR pioneers who was here at Hopkins with others who developed this technique and um, brought it forward and through um, you know, developing it and then rolling it out for others to learn how to do it. And so through that article, I found my source that I was looking for in the Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation Conference Proceedings. This is 1966. And um, this is the question in the Q&A, when do you start or decide not to start uh, CPR? And this is James Ellum, who was a co-worker, co-author um, with Dr. Jude. You start CPR whenever there is a sudden cardiac arrest. You do not start it on a patient with an incurable or intractable chronic disease. Then goes on to say if there's ambiguity, give the benefit of the doubt, start it, but figure it out as soon as you can. And if it's not appropriate, you stop. Now what's interesting, and you can, thanks to the wonder of Google Books, you can search this entire proceedings online. And you'll see that there is a lot of detail in included in this whole how they came about with not just the technique and the steps of CPR, but how they would make this a standard in all healthcare facilities. It didn't start with lay people. So uh, things like would the ambulances be wide enough to accommodate the procedure. And so it, it dawned on me that I think maybe we need to start thinking about the same level of detail at the stage we're at now, which is what are appropriate situations when you would not provide CPR. And that might make you think, really? Are we talking about this again with everything that's wrong in the world? Why do we keep coming back to the same kind of topic of CPR? This is what got me started in ethics in the mid-80s. Uh, but I, really, I don't think that's a surprise if you think about it. For most of us, that will you know, be the moment that transitions you from um, being alive to no longer being alive. What does that mean? That's a huge existential question. And it's really been at the, at the root of many of the um, issues of moral distress that you've heard about. So clinicians are starting to feel bothered by this. Uh, are we doing too much at the end of life? Are we, um, are we using too much of our technology, CPR being one of those technologies? And so um, the, the rationale that, that is provided often is that we're uh, setting aside that if the patient didn't want it, it's a kind of harm that you're doing something they didn't want. But for patients that didn't voice a, a, a specific preference, um, it harms the patient. Well, if someone is in cardiopulmonary arrest, unless you're considering maybe those near-death experiences where people describe almost dying and floating outside their body and then feeling pulled back by the CPR efforts, I really don't think you could suffer because you're unconscious during the process of CPR. And I think what clinicians are really talking about is feeling that this is disrespectful to the body that this is something that's undignified and that as we get more certain that someone is dying, that we owe them um, a different kind of care than what has been described as flogging the patient. So if you go back to that proceedings document that I talked about, they have actually very interesting graphics, courtesy of the, my hometown, Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, about how uh, people have been attempted to be resuscitated over the course of history. Um, rolling over a barrel, um, there's the flogging actually, that was something that was done. I left out the one about here, um, filling an animal bladder with smoke and then putting it through the rectum, but um, hanging people upside down. So these seem like very undignified ways of treating a person before they die, but of course if they worked, they would say, okay, that's okay, you have to weigh what the, whether the indignity or the burden is justified based on the benefit that's gained. And I really think it points to this need to redefine what we mean by doing everything. I think we should always do everything. It's just a question of what does that mean for the particular patient in front of you. And this idea that, you know, we've all heard this language, there's nothing we can do. Um, there's certain phrases I'd like to eradicate from the um, clinical repertoire. And that um, I think that everyone hopefully in this room has experienced the uh, moment of being with someone who um, is dying or hearing a story about someone that you love who's dying where it went as well as it could go. And that um, fewer, fewer of you have experienced the opposite, where some it's been botched in one way or another. And um, I heard many stories, when I just used to do hospice and sit in the plane and people would say, you know, what do you do? And then when you tell them hospice after they say, oh, that must be so depressing. Um, they would inevitably start telling stories, and they would either fall in one of those categories of how they had hospice and it was the most amazing thing, 
thing or how um, someone died and it was still haunting them. And I really think that I consider that a public health issue that gets uh, underappreciated. That that toll that that takes on um, minimizing their ability to flourish uh, in any way that we can, you know, human flourishing is um, impaired when you don't provide the kind of care that we know minimizes regrets and helps people make sense of not just um, their loved one's death, but their own mortality moving forward. So preventing those bad outcomes, I don't think, is doing nothing. I think that's important. And this was, uh, Bob Arnold wrote an article, this is a, a open access on that link, what to do after the patient has made comfort measures only. I really think this applies for every patient, not just when you write that magical order for comfort measures if you're writing more. Your managing incentive, supporting the family, honoring spiritual religious traditions, facilitating goodbyes, and offering a choice of where to die. Um, this doesn't come naturally. It's like women that think, you know, that breastfeeding is an instinct and everybody knows how to do it. Well, that's not how it works. Most women need to learn how to do it. And if you don't have someone showing you, then you're less likely to breastfeed and you to, uh, the baby doesn't get the benefits of the breast milk. Same thing with a best supported death. So really what I'm talking about today is, is most folks' order forms, which is one tree in the forest of the best supported death. Here I have a quote from, this is from, uh, this is appropriate because Umberto Echo just died within the last month. It's from a character in his book, The Island of the Day Before. And uh, it is necessary to meditate early and often on the art of dying to succeed later in doing it properly just once. And we all know that we're a death-denying culture, that we don't really get many opportunities. I think that's changing now. You'll see a lot of, of movements to try and get people to approach these conversations, which are difficult conversations. So, what better way to demystify death than having, um, let's have dinner and talk about death, which is one of the movements. Death cafes are common. Actually, I got confirmation that this death cafe at Maryland's campus is open to anyone. You don't have to be a human affiliate. So, um, you can come and check it out. It's, again, it sounds kind of macabre, but what people who have experienced an end of life learn is that when you focus on death, it's really about embracing life and sort of Zen concepts of being in the moment, not taking for granted the time you have left, and um, you know, communicating. If, if anyone has anyone seen these cards, go wish cards. It's a way to kind of open this conversation. I admit I thought it was kind of overly simplistic, but I'll, we'll pass it around. Um, I brought it with me to dinner with my husband and a friend just to make it less boring. And, um, <laughs> and it was interesting. We had, like, it did prove, you're supposed to really ideally have two packs and then the healthcare agent, um, surrogate decision maker, build, you know, sorts them based on what they think the patient would want. And then the patient sorts based on what they think. And I need to hear it. Anyway, it's really supposed to provoke, pro um, provoke discussion. So these are some of the the initiatives, I think, that have uh, been undertaken in preventive life care, obviously hospitality of care, and this clinical ethics work, I think, focuses on a lot of the issues at end of life that present conflict. Advanced directives in this Pulse most are really more recent, 90s, 1990s, and Pulse originated in Oregon. This was an attempt to reconcile this um, disconnect between what patients were, some patients were saying they wanted at the end of life and what was actually happening. And, um, so the idea was to get um, this advanced care planning conversations where you could document future wishes, um, ideally appoint an agent, and that recognizing that this is shared decision making and that wishes should be transferable from one institution to the next. This is a little bit of like a Goldilocks metaphor here, and that people were saying, well, a DNR order really only addresses if there's cardiopulmonary arrest, and it's really too narrow to get at the complexity of end of life decision making. But advanced directives are really too broad, um, and they don't do the job. And that maybe poll stories are just right, I think that might be overstating it, but we can decide when we have our Q&A at the end. Um, but the main goals and challenges are similar, it's just that advanced directives are there to identify what values and preferences will guide future treatment, and ideally who can speak, maybe I should say who should speak for the patient, who can and should speak for the patient, whereas Pulse is right now. So what do we want right now? But both of them rely on documenting these preferences in a way that others will understand what was intended later on. And also making forms available when needed. 
So this is the Pulse. Uh, if you go to this website, you can get all kinds of resources. We use some of these for the chart review study I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but you'll see that uh, West Virginia and Oregon are the mature programs, and Maryland is, is grayed out. Maryland is a program that actually doesn't conform to Pulse requirements. So there's ways that that were intentional, I think, by those who developed Pulse in Maryland. They, they looked at all the other programs and decided that there could be improvements made. Um, the downside of that is that they don't conform, so they get a green spot, and that we can't as easily compare data from other states. But as an example, while the Maryland's most uh, medical orders for life-sustaining treatment form is mandated, is still optional. No one has to fill it out, which is one of the requirements for the Pulse paradigm. It is mandated that a nurse, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, or a physician complete a MOLS form for patients in certain um, categories. So if you're admitted to any one of these facilities or if you're discharged to one of these facilities, and there are certain exceptions for hospital patients. <coughs> so uh, one of the, the, the pioneers of the Pulse program, Susan Hickman and colleagues, Bud Hammes, I'll talk about a little bit, um, just did a chart review, or a summary of studies of Pulse and Pulse like orders. And they included 23 research studies in this review. Most of them, I would say about half of them were um, from Oregon, and most of them were chart review studies. And what they found was that uh, this is a form that's completed more frequently by older white patients at the end of life. Non-white patients that complete a Pulse are more likely to select aggressive interventions uh, in, in this Research the summary, they found that cancer and heart disease were the most common diagnoses for people that completed the MOLS. Um, there was some evidence that uh, even if the patient didn't sign the MOLS or complete the MOLS, Maryland doesn't have a signature for the patient, um, but even if they weren't the ones that were uh, instrumental in the orders, that they were involved most of the time, which is promising. And also, that another study that showed that their MOLS orders were consistent with reports of prior patient decisions. Uh, they did find, for the most part, there were some errors, and we'll see the same thing that we found. Pulse did alter treatment consistent with the orders that were written. So if you did have Pulse orders written, they were, for the most part, followed. And that, um, while a lot of people complain uh, about the orders, that there were generally positive clinician attitudes, more so in mature Pulse states. So if you get more familiar with the form, you complain less. Uh, and that COVID status was not predictive of other orders. So and we'll see that in our data that um, just because you have a full code on page one doesn't mean that you'll not have restrictions on other treatments on page two and vice versa. If you have uh, no CPR on page one, there are patients that still have um, preferences for other treatments like blood or um, fluids on page two. So the idea here is that there's a step to success of Pulse, and it starts with just getting people familiar with what the form is, how to fill it out, um, really a focus on page one, which is the CPR, the resuscitation orders. This is what the EMTs use if you get called to the home by an ambulance to know whether the person is a full code or there's a no code order. And then as the, you get to a more mature use, um, there's an increase in the advanced care planning and a movement to actually including more orders on page two. So just as a review, uh, and just to have this up, we can come back to this when we have Q&A. This is the first part of the whole score for Maryland is certification for the basis of the orders. Again, the patient is not signed. Maryland's whole, uh, it's a medical order. You don't usually sign medical orders. And um, you certify the, whoever's completing it that either the patient, the agent, guardian, surrogate, or guardian of a minor uh, was the basis for the discussion that prompted the orders. Or you could select it was the advanced directive of the patient or other legal authority in accordance with provisions of Maryland's Health Care Decisions Act. For example, if you have a two physician certification, that CPR would be medically ineffective. And that's the basis of the orders. That would be what you would check there if you don't have a guardian or someone else agreeing to that. Um, and then the bottom line is if there is a, um, if there are declined orders, um, then you would be by default full code. And these are just the resuscitation orders for Maryland. So um, attempt CPR and then no CPR, you have options for allowing intubation, no intubation, but um, CPAP, BiPAP, non-invasive forms of ventilation, and then none of those two in supportive care. Just as a measure of comparison, this is Mer uh, Oregon's 
orders, which are different. So they're accomplished the same thing, and I don't want to confuse you, but I put this slide up in case people have questions about how it's different. Um, so it essentially accomplishes the same thing, but with different options for checking. So organized differently. So back to Maryland. Page two has options for other treatment preferences. And these are the categories. And the ones that are asterisked allow for you to indicate time limits. So you would allow ventilation, but only for a period of time. I have a colleague that um, texted me and said, I'm thinking that I want to put on my mold, a bright emulsion for myself that precludes um, trace. I I'd be on a ventilator, but once I got to the trace part, that'd be it. So we were talking about whether she could break one for herself. Probably not. Um, so problems encountered, okay, that guy looks a little scary. This was back in 2012 when the program was implemented for a year. So 2011 was when it was mandated in Maryland. And we had a MOLTS workshop and got feedback, um, just workshop attendees, were identifying basically two categories of problems they had with the MOLTS form. One was just inherent to the program itself, that they are mandating uh, these forms being at least addressed with patients in hospital settings, and this is too difficult to have a conversation in such a setting. It's overburdening people who are not yet um, in that category of being seriously ill, which the form is intended for. And um, it's you know mandatory to complete the most, but not mandatory for a patient to complete an advanced directive, so you really can't get that complementarity. The, the other uh, barriers or are, are dissatisfactions were really with how it was implemented. So it was based on people's skill level um, with end-of-life communication or filling out the form or they didn't feel like they wanted to. Errors in completion that were discovered. They distrusted the accuracy of how someone else completed it. Um, and difficulty keeping up with the most recent version. And then others, people talked about handing out black blank forms and telling the patient to fill it out. Uh, there is a worksheet that's used for that purpose to kind of help people know what orders they would want. But they were talking about actually having the patient fill out their own orders, which is not recommended. And also having surrogates uh, either override the most or um, the family disagreeing with maybe what the patient wanted based on either advanced directive or the patient telling you. And then sometimes other people had the conversation and came up with the orders that should be written. Um, but there was difficulty getting a physician to obtain um, a signature from. And then this inconsistency with Maryland Healthcare Decisions Act. So say you've got a certification of medically ineffectiveness um, or CPR and the MOLTS was filled out full code, uh, that that would be a, a, a disconnect. All right, so here's our chart review. Finding, this is the, the number part of your sample. Um, so these are, this is our sampling. Basically, we conducted a chart review like many of the other studies, and on the full paradigm, they have a lot of resources for that. Um, so for hospitals, last 20 adults, non OB, non psych, non trauma discharges to one of those qualifying facilities you saw, and then the last 10 adult deaths in the same category. And if they were under 100 beds, half of that number. And then you'll see for nursing home assisted living, last X number of admits or deaths hospices, um, all deaths, and home care admits, and dialysis, you'll see random 30 current patients. We had a hard time recruiting from uh, home care and dialysis for um, various reasons, but the percentage in red is the facility response rate. So just as an example, where 24 or 50 hospitals participated and sent in 452 chart reviews um, not every chart review had moles, some chart reviews had more than one mole, so you'll see the total numbers of moles forms. And then you could really only, we assumed that the late, the most recently dated moles was the active moles. Some were not, many were not voided properly, so you'd have multiple moles. But we interpreted the most recent ones as the active moles. So that was coupled with the chart review to be um, that active mole. Um, I'm not sure, there, there were some uh, redactions that we couldn't see, so some, we asked people to redact any kind of patient identifiers and sometimes they got carried away. So I don't know if they got carried away more for men than women, but we have a few who are female. Um, Maryland is, uh, I have that data somewhere, 51% overall female census numbers. So uh, these are you know people that are not, 
maybe older, it's an older sample, so maybe women live longer. That might account for the higher number than females. Um, we have mostly white, so 79% white, um, and that is consistent with our state, is 30% black overall, 60% white. And obviously that differs based on whether you're in the city or the town. Um, so this is the uh, basis for the order. So you'll see that for hospitals, 63% uh, of the chart reviews that had moles had the patient as the basis for completing the moles. And that that number was lower is not surprising for assisted living, 39%, uh, and um, so forth. Uh, I'm just gonna, this is a lot of numbers on this slide. I just wanna draw your attention to the HCDA, which is the basis being that Healthcare Decisions Act, very low numbers there. And overall, in the chart reviews, there were five instances from hospitals of just not on a whole score, but just determining that a treatment was medically ineffective, um, and 45 from long-term care facilities. So there's more of the certifications for medically ineffective happening at, at, in long-term care. The error rate overall, the error meant that people either left that whole section blank uh, or selected two things that were you know, contradictory. Um, vary, but overall 16% error rate. And then as, as far as the orders go, um, CPR then for hospital patients, about half, 52% uh, that had a most uh, had selected a temp CPR, and um, that number was uh, lower for nursing homes, and that seems to make sense, just intuitively, and then in the, in the final col column you have the total of almost. So the final column is not just paired with chart review and every single mole. So the numbers are, are different there. So some charts, and I'll show you in a minute, have several moles. Error rates are fairly low in this section, which I guess is good. Overall, 3% error rate of people either leaving a blank or checking more than one box. So we did see the same thing that, there was, uh, that was seen in other research. <laughs> that um, of all patients who had a chart review that had a pulse attached to it, 62% um, of non-whites selected a temp CPR, whereas only 32% of whites selected um, that category. So um, more non-whites are selecting more aggressive treatment, and we can talk about reasons for that. Um, and then of all the hospitalized patients who had either a do not resuscitate, do not attempt resuscitation order, or a pulse order with no CPR orders, um, there were 86% were white and 14% were non-white. That compared, you can see the uh, all of our chart reviews. That number is higher than what we see collectively. All right. So you can either advanced directives use. This is either your glass is half full or half empty. We asked basically, was there any notation that there was an advanced directive, and then whether the advanced directive was actually in the chart. And so um, the bottom number is both. So if they made any mention whether or not it's in the chart, those are your percentages. So better than what you've seen in literature, I think there's been you know low rates, 20%, 24%. We're getting higher, especially in long-term care, which is promising, but still lower than what you would want it to be, 40%, 47% overall. And the mean age, now we, we censored, I should say, uh, age just to not have to deal with HIPAA. So since the age 90 or over is a HIPAA element, we don't want people have to go through HIPAA waivers. So if a, chart, a patient or resident was over 89, they just got counted as 90. So that will under that will skew your, your age estimates. But based on that, the mean age that um, an advanced directive was completed if we had the year of the, the completion was 75 years, and that was seven years prior to the chart review. So one of the interesting <coughs> findings is that for the, for the people who died, uh, this is, you know, I need to remember we had that designation, last admits or last discharge or last death. So when we only included people who died, there was a question we asked whether, whether there was any documentation in the medical record of the person having a terminal illness. And only 32% of hospital patients and 21% of nursing home patients had some documentation. Now you can expect that that's um, not surprising for some hospital patients. So we did ask for admitting diagnosis, and if the admitting diagnosis was stroke, let's say, um, that would make sense, that you wouldn't know that someone was terminal and they come in with an acute event. But if the admitting diagnosis is end-stage lung cancer or, um, you know, 
But then you might think, why is there a rotation of terminal illness? This was a meme that someone sent me. Um, we'll see if everybody can put it up on their 1970s disco music. My friend says, um, this is the way I want to go. Um, I tried to reverse image search this on Tina, and I because it's a meme, not a cartoon, I couldn't find the author. But this idea that it's becoming more difficult to uh, identify when is someone terminal, and that diseases that we once thought were terminal are now turning into chronic conditions. And I think that's complicating matters because advanced directives, living wills, are often uh, including language that triggers limitations if someone's in a terminal condition. So let's just take a little peek at, at that living will language. This is Maryland's living will language. If my doctor is certified that my death from a terminal condition is imminent, even if life-sustaining procedures are used, so imminent is left up to, to the clinician. This is where you get disagreements. Other people try to qualify that, you know, if there's no reasonable expectation of my recovery. Uh, this is a Jewish living will. This is more consistent with the hospice definition. Um, it, irreversible terminal illness such that death is expected within six months, no matter what treatment is provided, and if that diagnosis is confirmed by more than one physician. That's getting a little more helpful, okay? Of course, then it goes on to say, um, treat me according to the Jewish tradition, which then to get the rabbis involved. <laughs> Other language, um, this caught my eye. I saw this in more than one um, advanced directive that was attached to these chart reviews. Um, and they, this, this gets, I think, even more helpful. Because it starts to get you out into the values of the person, what they're really envisioning, and letting the clinician interpret how do you use your toolbox to achieve the goal. Um, recognizing that death is as much a reality as birth, growth, maturity, and old age, and it's the one certainty of life. If at any time I should have a terminal condition and my attending physician has determined that there can be no recovery from such condition, and here we see imminent again, my death is imminent where the application of life prolonging procedures and heroic measures would serve only to artificially prolong the dying process, and that goes on to say then you can stop saying that you don't think will help. And then they go on to say, I don't fear death itself as much as the indignities of de deterioration, dependence, and hopeless pain. So I want to be treated to minimize my suffering. And I actually searched this to see if it was template language. And I found that it was originally published in JAMA in 1983. A physician um, came across this and asked his patient if he had permission to publish this. And it was then republished later. This is just one more example. Um, the first. I, can realize, I realize I can't foresee everything, so this, these statements are meant to be a guide to my healthcare agent. Um, and this one, again, is a little more helpful, I think. If at any time my agent is satisfied that the use of certain life-sustaining procedures is not or would not be beneficial, for example, there is no reasonable expectation that the use of the procedures would lead to my recovery, or that the use of life, such life-sustaining procedures is or would be excessively burdensome, then it goes on to say you don't have certain things be held withdrawn. So, um, actually, let's skip that. We can come back to that. It was just what other people think the most um, complements or replaces the advanced directive, and it was small sample numbers there. So, um, percent of patients with the most form. Um, you'll see that uh, for the most part, setting <coughs> aside home health, uh, there the numbers aren't bad. So, for example, hospital patients. Who are discharged to a qualifying facility that mandates that a mold form be completed, 86% of them had a mold form. Okay, so at least people are filling out the form. Just leave aside a second why, whether they're filling it out right. And this was another question that were, was asked of <coughs> dialysis with these other facilities. Um, for home health, uh, was the patient referred to you uh, from the hospital without a mold or with a mold? 27% referred without, a little bit higher than we'd like to see. Um, in assisted living, if the patient was transferred from a hospital within the prior year but had selected on the MOLS that they didn't want hospital transfer. So again, there's some errors here, but it's, the numbers are horrible. This is uh, just whether there was a discussion in the medical record. Here I think we see areas where we can improve things. So not only just completing the MOLS, but when you're the clinician that's getting a MOLS, you're trying to figure out if um, you know, what's going on with these orders. If you get any kind of documentation, and I, we could all do one big primal scream about documentation, and I know that everyone's put up to the, their eyeballs in 
transportation burden. But it is really helpful to people down the road um, if something can be just written about what conversation led to these orders. And that is, uh, other than dialysis, um, pretty low. I mean, it could be better. It's, it's okay. No, nursing home hospice and dialysis is over 60%. But hospital documentation is um, 36%. So page two, remember page two is that page where you can write other orders. So there's all the um, nine categories and then there's a section that just has blank space. It says anything else you want to write. So um, you'll see other orders. So this is no orders. So where there were no orders, 66% uh, of hospital molds um, and 70% of those discharged to qualifying facility had blank page twos. Um, 81% for home health, and you can expect that that's normal for someone who's selecting, you know, and uh, I'm not, at the end of my life, I'm not terminal, and I'm, you know, um, full code, um, you wouldn't maybe expect to see that, but as you get closer to those patients that are being discharged where you know they really need hospice or palliative care, and they're not getting it, and you're worried, um, that might be where um, trying a little bit harder to consider options for page two might be helpful. This other order section was blank for most of the charts. And where the, we did see um, orders in the other order section, they were primarily a stamp for the hospice with the contact infor information for the hospice. In some cases, you'll see no labs, no waste kind of thing. It might be redundant to what was uh, earlier in the form. And we did find, consistent with the other research, uh, that people who had selected a full code on page one had limits on orders in 310 out of 770. So 40% of the time, even though they wanted a full code, there were some limitation they requested on page two. And then for people who had not just any um, no code, but an option B, which is the most restrictive, um, of those patients, 832 of them, 629 had some requests on page two for something to be provided that you might think they wouldn't want if they were um, comfort measures only. All right. So this is getting at, you know, these are the number of molds attached to each chart we do. So the, the red there is anyone who had at least one mold form, the percentage that had only one mold form. And what we're trying to get at there was uh, the idea is that the mold form is transferable, so you don't want to just keep avoiding it and writing new ones. Uh, but that if a patient's preferences or condition changes, you really should be avoiding the right new ones. So maybe this indicates that there could be more voids uh, that we're just relying on that same old form and we're not revisiting um, and writing a new one and voiding. And for hospital patients, there was 16% that were voided after hospital admission um, of those that came in with the molds. And then um, that was a mean of about seven days after admission that the most form was voided. And the majority of voids were incorrect, so for avoiding it, you have to put a line through void and initials. So people aren't doing that right, so room for improvement there. And then as far as accuracy, so how do we know that they're accurately filled out? Well, we're limited in how much we can know that because, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example that I think you'll understand why. Um, for patients, who did not have any documentation of having an appointed healthcare agent, um, who had a healthcare agent checked as their basis for the certification, that would be considered an error. So that happens 10% of the time. And then patients transferred to the hospital with a no <coughs> hospital transfer preference selected on page two was, um, there were small numbers there because we had to know whether they were transferred within the last year and um, other things happening. That was 9%. Um, if they had a do not re attempt resuscitation order in the hospital and they were discharged to a qualified facility with an attempt CPR, that was small numbers. What's interesting there is that about half of those were option B and the rest were options A1 or A2. So in the hospital where there is full no code, there was a nuanced no code on discharge for about half of those, which makes you wonder, you know, what's, is that okay? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. And then there were these other parameters where if they were, so we, we could only really tell 
if someone had an advanced directive, if they were documented by the chart reviewer that they were in a terminal or end stage or persistent vegetative state, and if they had a mold that precluded that, um, that would be an error. So those numbers get to be pretty small. But of the numbers that we had, they were fairly low. And then the last one was if they had um, intubation and ventilation precluded on page one, but then on page two, they had a preference for ventilation that was also considered an error. Um, and that was low, 1%. <coughs> so for the conclusion on the data numbers, then we're going to go back to zoom out. Five minutes. Um, I think advanced directive use is improving, but still too low. But this raises the question of maybe it would be a good idea to start by uh, appointing a healthcare agent. I think this is underused. It's much easier. You need lower cognitive capacity. It's a simpler process. I just did this with my sister. She's resistant to the whole topic, but she definitely never wants to get in a hospital again. And um, she finally, I wore her down. Um, but it's it's an easier process um, if you pick you know the right person. That's another question. Um, mold orders are generally completed as mandated, so that means we're filling them out when we're supposed to. But the question of whether we're doing it correctly according to patient preferences or medical standard of care is still an open question. And I think that we can improve in how we document conversations, informing the mold, avoiding them the right way, and then revising the mold when warranted and consider increasing our use of the page two. So just back to, you know, a form is just a form. Um, it only works if you're really trying to identify what it is the patient wants and know and writing orders according to that and according to medical standard of care, and that's always a moving target, so that's the second one. Um, and it raises this question of, uh, this is the cartoon, there's no easy way, I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. Um, how much do we want to farm out um, these kind of conversations to others who are trained? And that is uh, a difficult question, because this is something that patients complain about, is that uh, they want to have these conversations, but they're not having them with clinicians. Um, if clinicians don't know how to have them, then you know, you kind of have a catch-22. I do think some of the, the there, there have been different initiatives, the, the Respecting Choices program has trained people on a better way to have a conversation. This is um, an article that if you want to get in touch with your mortality, this is the mixed method study of, out of Stanford. Out of 1,032 uh, house staff that have um, contact with people who are seriously ill, only 20 under 40. So uh, they, you know, did a survey and then they did a grounded theory qualitative study. And these were the barriers that they found specifically related to ethnic minorities. Um, and that, I think, is a subspecialty of skill sets that medical interpreters and clinicians really have to get more comfortable with. Um, this is uh, Angela Bolande's work at Harvard who developed a whole repertoire of videos to teach, inform and educate people. Some of them are open access, but you think even though it's a non-profit, non but you have to pay for the service. So there's limited ways that you can vet there. They have CPR and other kinds of helpful tools, um, including translations into multiple languages. Um, if we have time, you can ask about Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is like, this is the part where everyone should get up to speed is this confusing language and ways that we give mixed, mixed messages, this idea of when we say things like withdraw care and the euphemism and we don't think of how it sounds to the patient. Um, do you want us to restart your heart like it's a car battery? And people get um, <laughs> confused. Atul Blonde has really seen the light and written his book and raised attention to these issues. And then, if any, anyone hasn't looked at this, this is a little how-to guide on how to have these conversations including don't use DNR orders to introduce the concept of dying, which is like the last chapter in the book. So, um, you know, I think there is a way to do it. I think that it's both that we have to have people at a baseline level of functionality, but recognize that there's a limit to what we can expect clinicians to be proficient in. And there have to be experts that we can call in to help with this. So I'm gonna post these up here. These are additional questions that um, we're, we're, we were asked to do this study uh, by um, Healthcare Quality, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, so they funded the study and the idea was to have a phase one, which was just chart review, and then do phase two. And um, the questions on the left are the harder questions, the more research intensive questions um, to answer. 
because it would require validating that pulse pumps are actually accurate and that, um, you know, that is harder to do. So probably the easier thing to do, not easier from a qualitative perspective, but more pragmatic, is, um, you know, some focus groups, some interviews, but if this would be the time when we would welcome your opinions about um, what more we should or could learn about pulse use in Maryland and where we should go from here. So I just wanted to um, thank our advisory. We couldn't have done this without this advisory panel that we had. And we had a whole cadre of volunteers that helped do chart reviews, my research assistant. So um, of all of these chart reviews, only one facility sent in separate moles from, they didn't staple like our instructions told them to. So I think that's amazing. So thank you to uh, anyone in here who was involved in that. I really, we're very grateful. I'm going to go back to this. Slide so that we can look at our. So I think uh, I'll leave these up here, but we can go ahead and open it up to discussion, comments.
group writer that had this tattoo DNR and never put me in a hospital ever would be on the other end. Most people are in the middle. And I think that the problem with today's um, resources that we have at hand is that you get into that technology creep, and I think it makes sense to have people try things who are in the middle and see if it works. Um, the problem with that is that you get into that um, complicated realm where you've been in the ICU for three months and nobody wants to say that everything we went through didn't work. And that stopping process is very different in that space. And so you really need to prepare people for what that will look like stopping. So I think that we don't do a good enough job. And that was my Girl Scout cookie thing. I, I hated selling Girl Scout cookies, but I love camping. And I was, I would, I was a Girl Scout member. I used to go camping. But I was always impressed by when you'd leave a campsite and they tell you, um, you have to clean it up not just as it was to make it as good as what you found it, but better for the next person. And so what I'm kind of seeing sometimes is that people are, not always, uh, but they'll fill out the holes because they have to. And then you're thinking, well, this patient you just said is going to suffocate from end-stage heart failure. Well, they don't want hospice and, you know, um, they, they want full code. But there's no documentation of that, so you're kind of kicking the can to the poor ER people that are going to get this patient and think, why is this patient not getting palliative care? Um, so I think we could do better at, at making ourselves. Yeah. I think one of the challenges as a, as a clinician who uh, is supposed to be going through this process repeatedly with patients is that um, although the mandate came down for me to use this, no one taught me how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody taught anyone actually how to do it. Uh, so we're all just doing some random whatever we're doing, um, and uh, I think that the, you know, everyone wants doctors to be better communicators, but we haven't as a, as a profession, or I would argue as a society, sort of put the resources to support that. So if we don't teach people how to have very difficult conversations, not as just as individuals, but you know, I, these are not, it's not just me and my patients. Right. It's all 30 right. of us right. and my patient on a different day. So that's a very different sort of communication and decision making model than the like old guy who goes to his outpatient cardiologist, what do you want, Joe? Right. That's what a lot of this is based on. But in fact, most of us are dying in ICUs or are sick, at least right. in ICUs, where uh, the decision making model doesn't fit anymore. So I would say um, it's it's a challenge to figure out how to put the training behind the moles to give us some real teeth. Right, and, and, and what we did find is that um, reportedly a majority of facilities have um, most of their staff trained, but I think that what they got trained on is the most form, not necessarily how to have the kind of conversation that would inform how to complete it in a way that we would want it to be completed. And that's fracture who goes to a rehab has to have a moles. And do you have any information as to what percentage of these are being completed for people who you know, are coming in from orthopedic surgery as opposed to end of life care? Because it, for us it was very much a not one more box that we have to check in order to get them to a rehab. And the patients were often like, what did you not tell me about my surgery? <laughs> right. And I think, you know, we do have a data that really only applies to hospitals that are discharging. So we did ask the question and they don't have the data right because we have how many went to rehab, but it doesn't tell you, you know, whether they're orthopedic surgery, whether they just had surgery. But you know, everybody gets on a plane and gets that talk about it. Plane crashes, here's what you do. So I think there is a press, you know, uh, proof of concept that people can handle um, if it's approached in the right way. Um, but it's not, it, it, really, this is a resuscitation order form, so you're right. It is, a, it is not ideal to be broaching this topic for the first time at that anxiety ridden time when someone is going through surgery or being discharged. <laughs> right, but you know, I mean, there is a way to bring it up that I think can um, de escalate the kind of anxiety that's um, provoked sometimes. Renee? I just would say that we, so we looked at pediatric use of this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that we, we were really surprised about is that parents actually recommended that you talk about the most on admission. 
and it's for just that reason that you brought up, brought up is that people worry if they hear about it at the end that we haven't been telling them the truth about something. So they'd actually much rather hear it up front that, look, this is the spiel, we have to tell everybody about this. They would much prefer that be the approach than sort of the um, individualized and on the last day. Mm -hmm. that the 16% of hospitalized patients who revise their roles within four mm -hmm. days, because that's a pretty high number, that's almost one in five. I wonder if you can say anything about the reasons for that or which way you need to revise them. Yeah, but, um, I think that I don't have the data for exactly down on how they revised it, but um, I think that's not that surprising. I, I, I would argue that you probably should revise them all. I think we should see more revised molds myself. Because I think that when people are filling these out, and maybe the, the statistic to get at would be how many went from uh, a full code to a no code, not reverse, um, or some variation of that. But you know, I think that people go into the hospital obviously for acute care services, and so it's during that stay maybe that you have an event that conditions change and you realize that. You know, we opened this and we're not getting that. And so we need to rethink, are these bulk stores appropriate? So um, I don't, I think, like I said, I think that we probably need to look at, that might be something that we can address in the follow-up, is um, this idea of when are you not revising bulk when it should be revised, and when are you doing it where it's inappropriate? Do you have any other care to that? Scratch, Any other? in a situation where obviously untrained people came into the hospital room of my husband and didn't know what they were explaining. I was able to give them some information because I had been at the trainings that they did. <laughs> but um, it was kind of horrifying to think what might have come out of this. Yeah. <laughs> training, 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 I guess. And right, and you know, um, and they and Paul Ballard have been all around the state doing training. So uh, on one hand, we're lucky in this state because then not everybody has funding for training. I think another thing that would help would be registries um, in, in addition to the training. Once we get the old form to be actually accurate, having it accessible, uh, and then being able to do more research like Oregon can do, and they're, they're in the works on that. The state office of the end of life quality council is working on that. So, yeah.
requirement in other states that the patient or surrogate sign. And um, this was argued to be evidence of, um, the signature was evidence of the, the patient's concurrence that the form accurately reflected or corresponded to wishes. So that's the, uh, the justification, I think, in Oregon and elsewhere. Um, but the, my sense is the argument prevailed here, uh, which is a point you made, Anita, uh, that what other physician's order form do we require patients to sign? That it's a category error uh, to have patient signatures on medical orders. Patient signatures belong on advanced directives. And this is said over and over again not to be an advanced directive. The twain do meet, but they're different. Um, so that's the that's the major difference. And it, I mean, <laughs> one of these days there will be data about this, I suppose, uh, about the correspondence between one of your questions, uh, right. patient wishes, and what actually happens. But the theory is, um, no, don't put the burden on the patient, or especially on the family. Uh, we're writing this order that says no attempted CPR and various other uh, interventions we're not going to attempt to do. And now we want your signature on this. It's the signature on the death warrant problem. Right. Um, so right. that was the, that's the main variant, I think. And it's arguable either way, but I believe that's why uh, the Maryland uh, form is different in that respect. As to the breadth of it, um, that's an interesting question, and I don't know the explanation. That's to say Oregon started out, and still does, focusing on patients who are really sick. Um, not the 35-year-old who blew out her knees skiing um, and goes to the orthopedist and then goes to rehab. So Maryland is virtually unique, I believe, in having that broad a scope for this kind of order. Um, why that choice was made, I really don't know. It's an interesting problem whether folks would do a better job if the scope were narrowed. On the other hand, it's a way of introducing a topic to people right. Uh, and getting them to start thinking about it. If not for themselves, maybe for their mom or their dad. So you, a lot of this would be, um, if not resolved, at least informed by more data, but I right. um, don't have that yet. Right. I actually have a question, uh, since I got the mic, I get to ask you. Um, um, of the two uh, so-called mature um, programs, West Virginia is perhaps the more interesting to us because it's closer and ain't the West Coast, and, um, and it's newer. I don't know how long they've had um, their well, most programs. Not certainly not as long as Oregon. Um, right. I guess my question is, and, and maybe this is beyond the scope of your research, but I wonder if you know, um, what did they do during the first one, two, three, four, five years to try and um, get this more effectively integrated? I mean, the theory is that this is a scaffold for what ought to be happening anyway, which is robust informed consent discussions. Um, and so, if they do it better, because they're mature, um, what did they do early on to get going? And I we, might, we might learn from. Right, I interpreted mature to see how long it's been in existence. But I know what West Virginia has a lot of initiatives to educate people and, and the like advanced care planning um, initiatives. And so, I think that it's just um, they've been at it longer. And the longer you get at it, you know, people get used to the language, they get used to hearing about it and you incrementally improve, but it doesn't pay off until you get several years in, where you work out all these kinks and you address the issue of clinicians feeling increasingly frustrated because they don't have the training that they need um, and how to approach this to 